Your brain is capable of thinking fast and slow. And I can prove it to you by playing a little game with you called the Stroop Test. So in this test, I want you to tell me the color of the font of the word that I'm about to show on screen. So for example, this would be red, this would be blue, and this would be yellow. Remember, I'm looking for the name of the color of the font that the word is, not what the word actually says, okay? Okay, so what color is this? What about this? What about this? And what about this one? And this one? And this one? Did you notice how on the last three, it took you a little bit longer to figure out what the right color was? That's because, as you could probably tell, the name of the color in the word and the actual color of the font were different. They're discongruent. And when we have discongruent information, our brain has to work a little bit harder to figure out what the right answer is. And so, as you can tell, your brain doesn't always work at the same pace. It depends on how difficult the task is. Sometimes your brain thinks quickly, and sometimes it works slowly. Now, you've probably heard of Thinking Fast and Slow before, and that's because of this book right here. This is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and it's one of the most popular books in the field that this channel is all about, behavioral science. Now, Kahneman's version of Thinking Fast and Slow, as he describes it in the book, are System 1 and System 2. This is Kahneman's way of thinking about the brain. So if you're unfamiliar with System 1 and 2, let me explain to you really quickly what those two systems are. So System 1 and System 2 are basically the fast and slow modes of thinking. System 1 being the fast one, and System 2 being the slow one. And they have some very distinctive properties. System 1 is not only fast, but it requires less cognitive resources, less brain power. It's also more prone to bias, and in Kahneman's view, more prone to errors. Whereas System 2, it's slower, it requires more brain power, but according to Kahneman, it's more reliable and generally makes less errors. Now in life, around 90% of the decisions that we make are done using System 1. That's because it would be far too inefficient and way too resource intensive for us to use System 2 for every single decision that we made. And so we rely on these kind of shortcuts and rules of thumb ways of decision making in order to guide us through our life to make most of our decisions pretty accurately. However, Kahneman argues in the book that System 2 is sometimes required to kind of override System 1 and help us make better decisions. Now, according to the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, when System 1 is active, System 2 is not active. And so Kahneman argues that really these two systems can only operate independently. And one of the examples he gives is that imagine you are walking along a street with a friend. And as you're walking, you and your friend are chatting and you're walking and chatting and then your friend asks you a very complicated math problem. For example, what's 462 times 125? Right, now this is a pretty complicated math problem and a lot of people trying to solve this mentally would probably have to stop walking as they try to figure it out. Now that's a bit weird, right? Why do you have to stop walking to figure out a maths problem? Well, it's because your brain is allocating more of those mental resources that he was using for walking, which is not very much, but because you have this very complicated task at hand, your brain then has to stop other activities and sort of reallocate all those resources towards the more complicated task at hand. So that's an example of us shifting from system one to system two when system two is required. So, you know, it's very helpful to think of the brain in this way as system one and system two. However, system one and two are just one example of what psychologists call a dual process theory of the brain. So a dual process theory is any theory of how the brain works that splits the brain into two separate decision-making systems. Kahneman's version, system one and system two, just happens to be the most popular and widespread one because of the popularity of his book. However, System 1 and System 2 aren't the only dual process theory in psychology, and they definitely aren't even the first dual process theory in psychology. So in today's video, I wanna show you two more dual process theories, two different examples of thinking fast and slow. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be able to appreciate how thinking fast and slow permeates to many different types of psychology, and how System 1 and System 2 really just aren't that special. Now, the other two theories that I'm going to talk about certainly aren't the only other two dual process theories that exist out there. There are lots of different dual process theories out there. These are just two that I happen to be very familiar with and that I think are easy to explain and interesting for you to hear about. So let's start with the first one, the elaboration likelihood model. Okay, so the elaboration likelihood model, or just ELM for short, 
is a dual process theory that explains how people are persuaded to do something. It argues that, surprise, surprise, there are two different ways that people can be persuaded. They call it the central route or the peripheral route. And these map pretty closely onto system one and system two, with the central route being the thinking slow, the system two route, and the peripheral route being more of the system one fast thinking route. The argument for the elaboration likelihood model is that for things that are more important to us, for example, things that are very expensive or things that we're gonna use daily, we're more likely to be persuaded by the central route, whereas things that are unimportant, you know, decisions that won't really have a big impact on our life, for those things, we're more likely to be persuaded by the peripheral route. Let me give you some examples. So imagine you're buying a house. A house is a very important purchase. It's one of the most expensive things that we'll ever buy in our lives. We're going to live in it, so we're going to experience it every single day. And it's obviously going to have just you know a massive impact on our lives as well as being very expensive. And so for things like buying a house, we're more likely to be persuaded through central root persuasion. Central root persuasion would be logical arguments. So we'll be looking at things like what's the square footage of the house? How long is it for me to commute to my place of work? Are the rooms big enough to service the things that I wanna do in this house? Does it have good water supply, good internet, etc., etc.? And so these are very rational, reasoned, logical arguments for why we should do something. And so, you know, somebody who's trying to sell a house would do well to communicate those rational arguments because those are going to be very persuasive. Whereas take something that's less important, like toothpaste. Whether you buy Colgate or Crest toothpaste isn't going to have a massive influence on your day-to-day -day life. And so for small decisions like this that are inexpensive, that aren't that consequential, we're more likely to be persuaded by the peripheral route. And peripheral arguments are things that kind of lean into our fast, automatic, biased way of decision-making. So for example, we might be swayed by the authority bias. So if we see an advert for Colgate toothpaste and it's endorsed by a dentist, then we might think, oh, well this toothpaste is endorsed by a dentist, so it must be a good toothpaste. Even if the advert doesn't actually provide any logical arguments as to why Colgate is superior over Crest or any other toothpaste, we still might be convinced by this, you know, very quick shortcut way of thinking, oh, it's endorsed by dentists, it must be good. Or for example, imagine buying a cheeseburger, right? A cheeseburger, whether we buy it from McDonald's or we buy it from Hardee's, it's not going to have a massive influence on our life. So that's why these advertisers rely on peripheral route advertising to try and persuade us. For example, they might use an attractive person to eat their burger on an advert and we go, ooh, me like attractive person, me also like this burger. So, you know, as you can tell, it's a very peripheral way of persuading somebody. There's no real logical arguments in there. They're not talking about the flavor of the burger or you know why it's superior in terms of its meat quality or anything they're just looking like oh attractive lady me want to eat burger right so these are the central and peripheral routes to the elaboration likelihood model and as you can tell these map pretty cleanly onto the concepts of system one system two or just thinking fast and slow in general but like i said i wanted to explain two different dual process theories to you other than Kahneman system one and system two. So let's talk about the second one, which is habitual versus goal-directed. Okay, so habitual versus goal-directed behavior is us talking about how you build habits. As long-term viewers of this channel will know, one of my specialties in behavioral science is habit science. So when we think about habits, we often split behaviors into habitual versus goal-directed behavior. And again, these kind of map pretty neatly onto system one and system two, or thinking fast and thinking slow. In this case, the system one fast way of thinking is habitual behaviors, because habits, by their definition, are fast, automatic decisions that don't require a lot of mental resources. Whereas goal-directed behavior is the opposite. These are effortful decisions that we're making in order to try and achieve a certain goal. And it's easy to understand how these two things are related to each other. Imagine you just bought a new coffee machine. The first time you use that coffee machine, you don't know how to use it. And so in order to make coffee the first time, you have to engage quite a lot of mental resources. You might even have to read an instruction manual. You'll certainly be looking around the machine, trying to figure out what the best process is, what the best settings are in order to get the perfect cup of coffee. This might continue for a day or two or even three, but after you've done it a few times, this behavior starts to feel a lot more automatic. You start to come into a routine. You start to figure out what the best settings are. And the next thing you know, this behavior of making coffee 
feels very automatic. You wake up in the morning, you go downstairs and you just make this coffee almost on autopilot without thinking. You can even think about things you're going to do later in the day while you're going through the process. At that point, the behavior has become more habitual. So as we've been talking about, it's quite easy to see how this maps onto the concepts of thinking fast and thinking slow. When you go down to make the coffee the first time, you're thinking slow, but after you've done it enough times with enough repetition, now you're thinking fast, now you're thinking habitually. But the interesting thing about comparing the habitual versus goal-directed model against system one and system two, or thinking fast and slow, is that actually these don't really feel like two separate systems, even though they map quite neatly onto them. Instead, the better way to conceptualize this, and this is sort of generally accepted among habit experts in the field, is that habitual and goal-directed behavior are better thought of as two ends of a spectrum. That first time you go and make your coffee, yes, it's very effortful, yes, it's very system two-esque, a lot more brain power involved, but through repetition and through doing the action day after day after day, it becomes gradually more automatic. And there isn't really a clear cutoff point in that journey as to when that behavior swaps from being a goal-directed behavior to being a habit. It just gradually becomes more automatic and a bit more habitual. And actually, the more that I've learned about psychology, the more I think this analogy is a better one for thinking about the brain. People have taken system one and system two out of thinking fast and slow and used it very little literally, thinking that the brain literally has two separate systems with separate brain parts that operate independently of each other, and that that's how we make our decisions. When in reality, it's better to think of system one and system two as just two ends of the spectrum, with system one being our brain not using that many mental resources towards a decision, to system two being allocating more resources towards a decision, and it's actually a much more useful and intuitive model to think of these things along a sliding scale, because many types of decisions fall somewhere in between. It really just depends on how complex and how difficult the decision you're trying to make is will determine how far along that scale you actually end up being. So I hope you found this video useful, guys. I always think it's really interesting to think about how all these different dual process theories are actually kind of talking about the same thing as each other. And then by comparing them, we can sort of figure out how the brain really works. So I hope you learned something new today. If you did, can you please give me a thumbs up down below because it really helps me out. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.